Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am pleased and honored to have our returning guest to the show. He is the author of Dri Who's Driving the Greater? And now his second book is now on, uh, I was going to say bookstores, but it is now available to be purchased online. The link is in the show notes. So scroll down and click on it. Purchase the book because you will not want to miss this book. And that is The DNA of great leaders, the key attributes of the best mayors and board chairs. Ian McCormack. Ian, thank you so much for doing this. This is going to be an honor and a pleasure to have you on and talk about this great book. I was going to say it was going to be an honor and a pleasure to be back on to be able to talk about this great book. So thanks for having me back. It was a, it was a lot of fun last time and I'm looking forward to it again this time. I, I am as well. But I, I guess the I guess the main question that we need to get off the bat is you wrote one book you weren't expecting to, so you've decided to write a second book that you really weren't expecting to. Where did this book come from, The DNA of Great Leaders? Uh, well, I should probably even preface this by a couple of people have given me ideas for another one, but uh, I'm trying to resist that actively so far it's worked out. This is because each book takes about a year to write and then get published, so it's a uh, pretty intensive. Where this one came from is, is kind of historical and it's almost an accident, much like the first one was. The first one is about role clarity, the, the greater book of overlaps and gaps and that sort of thing. This book, you got it? Right oh, behind look it. at that, <laughs> product placement. I came behind, there you go. This book is about, um, this book is about, the, well, like it says, the attributes of great leaders. And I've had an opportunity to work with mayors and reeves and board chairs and commission chairs and all sorts of those sort of things over the years. And they seem to, to me, as I work with more and more of them, I found themes starting to emerge about the ones who seem to be the most effective, not necessarily the nicest people, but the people who could get stuff done or the people who brought respect to the role or the people who um, kind of encouraged other people. And they see that's where the, the, the nexus of the book came, came about. And after the first book came out and I got some pretty good response to it, had a chance to speak to organizations and individuals about it. This one just kind of seemed to form. And I had some conversations. It's right up early in the front of the book. And one of my former colleagues, I was questioning her about, well, what gives me to write a book, the right to write a book about mayors or board chairs? I've never been a mayor. I've been board chair of lots of organizations. And she said, well, you have a unique perspective because you don't come in with any baggage, which I thought was a really interesting place to go. So it just kind of started and started and snowballed. And I reached out to Municipal World who were kind enough to publish the first book with this as an idea and they encouraged me to do it. So Chris, that's kind of where the book had come from. Uh, I'm not an author by design, more so based in experience and having, having the ability to share that. One of my company's values is, is wisdom. And it speaks to the ability we have to share what we've learned. And really, that's what this book and the last book, for that matter, are all about. Uh, I, I read this book. I read your very first book as well. We've had you on uh, once before. Um, when when I read books, it, it there are very few authors that I can sit down and I can actually read cover to cover and want to continue reading. And that is one thing that I find myself always fascinated with your books because I wasn't sure what I was going to be getting into in this book. And I'm so excited to talk about it a little bit more in depth here in a few minutes. But when I picked up this book, I was reading it. And as someone who has come from the municipal sector, who has worked with mayors, who has covered municipal politics, and who has spoken to municipal leaders, I kept reading this and I kept on pointing out to myself, well, I wish this mayor would have done this way or this mayor would have done this, or he had this attribute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you sat down with some pretty big mayors, some pretty uh, well-known names here in Alberta, uh, the, for, uh, uh, the mayor of Regina, the mayor of Yellowknife, the mayor of uh, St. Albert, uh, the former mayor of St. Albert. Um, was it easy to approach them and say, I want to pick your brain about what the best key attributes are for a mayor and a board chair? It was really easy, as a matter of fact. Really? The, yeah. So because I'd been working in the sector for a long time, I'd had re relationships with a lot of these people, which in some cases were actually antecedent to them becoming a mayor. So I'd seen them work through community work or through a council and then become a mayor or a reeve in some cases. And uh, it seemed to make sense to me that these people were displaying attributes I really liked. 
And I'm quite, I was quite happy to name these people. There's a list of them in the back of the book, but the dozen mayors that I actually interviewed. And people seem to be quite happy to share when I'm telling them what the project is about. I also tested with them what my thinking was about and, and got them to either corroborate it or suggest that maybe there were some slight differences. And even in the book, there are two, uh, there are some places where there are two different perspectives, which are incongruous, but both are effective on, on them by themselves. So that happened for most of the mayors. Some of them I didn't know and asked for introductions to. Uh, for people who knew somebody who was doing something interesting. Uh, there were, there's also in here a, an Australian mayor as well. And after the last book came out, uh, it was picked up by the Victoria Local Governance uh, Association, similar to a municipal association in Canada, one of the provinces or territories. And I had done a bit of work with them and spoken to them. And uh, through those relationships, I uh, developed a, a bit of a relationship with a, with a mayor by the name of Kim O'Keefe. Uh, from Greater Shepparton, which is just outside Melbourne. And she had come across or been referred to me as somebody who was a good mayor. So that was kind of where a lot of these came from. I was also, I mean, I could have done a whole bunch of interviews with mid-sized city mayors or town or village mayors, but I wanted depth and breadth. So you mentioned some of them. I had a, I've had a relationship with the mayor of Yellowknife, for example, for a while. St. Albert, same thing. Um, the mayor of uh, Parkland, no, sorry, of uh, Sturgeon County. I wanted a, so I wanted urban, I wanted rural, I wanted big city, I wanted small village, I wanted, so I've got Alberta, BC, Saskatchewan, Ontario, the Northwest Territories, and of course, Australia. So I was looking for depth and breadth. I was also looking for gender diversity as well. So they are half and half, literally men and women. And some of them are brand new. The mayor of Regina, for example, got elected in the most recent uh, yeah. Saskatchewan municipal election had never been elected to anything before so I was really interested to find out why she would think that that would be a good idea and whether the role was what she thought it was going to be and if you look at it from the other end of things the mayor the former mayor of uh, St. Albert a guy by the name of Nolan Krauss who's also written a book uh, yeah. had has been involved in local government for a long time and I wanted his take too on he decided to retire a couple of terms ago Alberta terms ago now so that's where those people came from. I, I had, had thought of some attributes. I tested it with them, made some changes as necessary, sent it back to the, all the mayors for their quotes and said, is this what you meant to say? And uh, back and forth a couple of times. And that's how we ended up where we ended up. Every chapter that's in the book has some input from at least one of the mayors I interviewed. I think there's probably a quote or two in every chapter. And that's done uh, consciously. Uh, in collaboration with the editors at Municipal World, who thought that was a good idea too. Now, I, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask this question because this book is the key attributes of uh, the best mayors and board uh, for board uh, chairs as well. But this isn't set in stone. This is not set in stone because I, I read this book and I said, oh, you missed this and I, I wish you would have put this in. And I guarantee you if some mayor in uh, Ontario who picks this up and says, well, I think you're completely up creek without a paddle on this. So how hard was it to write a book about attributes of what people should look for in mayors and what they what people should look for in themselves as mayors and board chairs and publish it and still say, OK, this is just a this is this is Ian's version of That's what right. I think. It's not what everyone's going to agree upon. So how hard was it for that aspect to write a book like this when you're defining what the key attributes are? I tell people it's the gospel according to Ian. Right? It's not the gospel. Because for precisely that reason, I, I, I may have made a note in the book too that you may think you may disagree with some, you may think I've missed some, I've included some that I shouldn't have. And in all those cases, you're right that this is not the be all and the end all as you refer to. This is what I have seen both in the best functioning mayors or most effective mayors or Reeves or commissioners or whatever. But there's a lot of it that's almost negative option that I've seen a lot of things that don't work or shouldn't have been done or I mean, somewhat contrary to the legal system. Uh, and I, so I've tried to flip those around and say, well, I'm not gonna interview those mayors. Chances are they're not gonna wanna have their names published anyway. But so then I can flip them around and say, this should not have happened this way. So if it should have, if it happened in the right way, what would it look like? And so some of the, the attributes that are in the book, particularly the ones that aren't kind of nurture related, things that are related to either technical skill 
or to the understanding of the depth of the community and that growing up in a community milieu, those sort of things were where I had seen things done poorly uh, and continue to see things being do, done poorly. And, but I still think that they can be done right. And that was one of the, the, the reasons or the impetus behind writing the book is sometimes, I wrote about this in the first book. Sometimes I think people who are new into the role don't really know what they don't know. So I don't know if we necessarily excuse them for doing some of the things that they do, but I can kind of understand how things ended up the way they are. Well, and, and, and you talk about that in the book, and I apologize, I don't remember what chapter right off the bat here, but you talk Me about- Me neither. You, you, <laughs> you mean either, that's great. Um, but in the book, you talk about, um, you don't get into a position like a board chair or a mayor and then stop learning, right? You right. always are learning. You're always trying to engage. You're always trying to make yourself better. Um, this is might be a, a little bit off kilter from what the book is about, but do you find that there are mayors in this country, in this province, in this world who are just okay with getting elected and just doing what they need to do and that's it and not growing the role to adapt to the ever-changing world that we are in yeah you know i had a conversation with the mayor this morning actually i think it was and i was talking to her a small town so the, the mayor or the council self-selects from within whoever the population happens to be they're not professional particularly in smaller places typically they're not professional politicians so I was having a conversation with her about the role of council and saying, you know, if all the decisions were easy, one, only one of you actually needs to be there. It's when those conversations and the decisions are difficult and will have some negative repercussions, at least in the short term, that the role where people really seem to inherit the role or grow into the role. And I also suggested to her and to many others, in fact, too, that the whole thing is transient or transitory. You've inherited the role of councillor or mayor or chair from somebody. You're going to do the best you can while you're there and then you're going to pass it on to somebody else and the mayor i said talked to this morning said yeah i want to leave the community better off than i found it and to me that's the piece about change and so that's where it takes courage to do some of the things that need to be done so there are people no doubt who come into the office just want to be the, the big person in town and make the decisions and tell me what to do and all that stuff but i think that there are a lot more people particularly in local government where there's not much in salary or no pension, perhaps maybe not even RSP top ups, where people want to do the best for their community. And they run for the job because they think they can do a better job than somebody else can. Um, that there's a role for ego in it. And it, I think you have to, that person has to believe they're good at what they do, or they've got some good ideas, and they're trying to get a very big interview panel to agree with them as they go through that. And so that ends up with the mayor and the whole council team for that matter, or board chair and board team wanting to make some change. Some, don't, a lot, don't understand what the job is until they get into it. Uh, and that's, that's problematic, both for the council and for the community and for administration who's trying to drag them along as well. I, I'm just gonna interrupt and say, some of them don't know what they're doing even after they leave politics. And that's just my own personal opinion on that one. Um, you know, I did, a, I did a talk for the board of the rural municipality of Alberta. They were doing a retreat. So I went in and they were the first organization I'd actually spoken to after this book came out. And I there in the book, it speaks about like three types of attributes. You've got the ones you just inherit as a person because it's like who you are. There's the ones you kind of grow into as you become understanding of your community. And then there's your technical skills, how to run a meeting, that sort of thing. And uh, so I, I would say, well, what happens if one of those attributes is missing? What if you don't have that personal, the, the personal piece? What if you don't have the community growth through the community? What if you don't have the technical skill? And so we explored that. And then some, one of the, the board members from RMA said to me, well, what happens, what about the person in the small town who's the default? Nobody wanted to run to be mayor. So that person gets tapped on the shoulder and said, you're gonna be mayor for the next four years. What do you do in that case? Cause that person may not have any of these attributes going for them. And I actually, that caused me to rethink things a little bit. And I, I thought it was a really interesting question. So what, what happens then? So I'll play, I'll play in that sandbox yeah, for sure. because there are a lot of communities in, and I'm just going to say Alberta because we're both from Alberta. We're both, sure. we are both Albertans. Uh, there are some, some rural municipalities and I say rural, I mean like villages of villages, like a hamlet, like they have a three person council meeting or three person council. None of them have been, like none of them actually have been elected. They've all been acclaimed because no one wants the job. And I don't say no one wants the job. They do want yeah. the job because they keep putting yeah. their name forward. But in that sense, 
does it do a disservice to a leader in those roles when you don't get challenged for a position of chair, a position of mayor, because then you can't grow as yourself. And then you have someone who becomes stagnant and saying, well, I've been acclaimed four times, so everyone must love me. And they get sort of uh, an ego on them to say, well, I I can do whatever I want because no one's going to challenge me next election. There is certainly danger to that. A democracy is self-selected. If I can't convince the best person in my community to run for office, part of that's on me, part of that's on them, and we get what we deserve. Now, you mentioned three-person councils, too. Oftentimes, when it's a small council like that, and sometimes the bigger ones as well, the fives, they elect a mayor annually or a reeve annually. Uh, Rural municipalities often do that, not always, but usually do that. Summer villages and some villages do that, too. Australia, one of the things I learned is they do that almost exclusively in most municipalities in Australia. There's an, app, there's an election from within of the mayor once a year. So they're running for that job once a year. So if the, if the role isn't being filled well, the person can either decide not to run again or they can be democratically retired by their colleagues. And then they, they, somebody else can take over. But there definitely is a danger. Not only that, we've seen that in the last month or so in Alberta. I may have the place wrong, but I think it's Viking, where a majority of council, including the mayor, resigned recently. And uh, now we're what, six, eight months after the last municipal election. And I can't remember why, I heard, I, I heard why, but I, I don't remember why. But what that does then is it leaves the province, uh, it leaves it up to the province because municipalities of course are creatures of the provinces and territories to fill the gap until there can be a, a series of by-elections in that case to, to rejuvenate council. And I think oftentimes that that happens because of a, a lack of role clarity, or a misunderstanding of power. Um, I heard a, sometimes we've seen non-municipal people now starting to fill the role of municipal administrators, chief administrative officers. And if a person comes into the role as a non-municipal person, say they come, they've come from emergency services, they've come from the military, they've come from some other role like that, which is command and control, and you try and put them into a, into a, dem- a democratic organization, and they think the mayor is the boss and the mayor really isn't the boss, but they act that way anyway. So you end up with some of that lack of role clarity, which is sand in the gears of good municipal operation anyway. So part of it's on the candidate, part of it's on the voter. I think a lot of it's on the voters. And part of it is also on the municipal administration too for onboarding versus good, uh, good orientation or even getting to those candidates prior to an election say, this is what the job really is. Do you really want it? You talked about uh, when sort of newbies, blue, green uh, candidates who win their mayorship or are elected into a position of power. And I have seen it where a person gets elected to mayor and they don't know what they're doing. They think they're going in and they're going to clean house and they're going to go in and basically they are going to run the show. It's not the CAO that's going to run or the CEO down in Australia. It's going to be this. It's going to be the mayor. The mayor's uh, the mayor's going to dictate down. That's one of the biggest learning curves that I think a lot of new counselors have to expect is you're just a vote. And I and I, I mean yeah. that with all due respect, because you 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 place the strategic priorities in place for the town the city the reeve whatever to move forward but there's a lot of attributes that people don't think that that's what they should be doing they should be going in there and dictating this street needs to be done because it's johnny's street and he's my neighbor for 15 years and we want to get that street done because that's more important to me as mayor or council even though street number x that's been dilapidated for 25 years needs more attention and should yeah. be fixed first when you were talking to your mayors and uh from here in alberta and across the country did they understand that did they understand that the mayor is to govern not or is the, the mayor is to be the strategic role and not the administration role yeah well i didn't interview those other mayors i interviewed <laughs> one of the mayors i thought who knew what the job was who, and I had, let me try that again. I have interviewed those other mayors, but oftentimes it's in the case of some sort of a municipal investigation because rather than as, a, as, as paragons of virtue that are gonna show up in a book someplace. So I think that, I think one of the key attributes of the mayors is that role of clarity is understanding where governance ends, where administration takes over and hopefully knowing that there is a bit of overlap 
because the mayor is mayor council is the symbolic head of the community if nothing else right yeah they're the ones who are welcoming the visiting delegation or cutting the ribbon on the new tanning salon in town they're the ones who are chairing the meetings even though they only have as many votes as anybody else they carry that that non-official authority anyway and they need to exercise that prudently and the best ones kind of know how and when to back off and when to give that role to somebody else i use edmonton as an example in this so very recently and the pope is coming to visit in a couple of weeks or three weeks the Edmonton City Council appointed an Indigenous member of council to be the deputy mayor during the time that the Pope, the Pope is in town. And I think that that was a very prudent thing to do, to recognize that this visit is about reconciliation. And so to put an Indigenous person front and center, can't be the mayor because the mayor is already elected, but kind of in that next role to say, I mean, authority-wise, it doesn't really mean very much. But symbolically, I think it's really important. And the best mayors, in this case, Mayor Sohi in Edmonton, would understand that that is kind of part of the role, the symbolic role of what they do. Those who think that they are in an authoritative state or that they are in a weak, sorry, a strong mayor system, uh, probably run up against frustration very quickly when they realize that they can't do the things, they, they can't do the sweeping changes that, as you referenced earlier, they were intending to do, and that the voters may have brought them into office to do. The voters not knowing that they couldn't do it either. How do we change that, though? Because uh, yeah. I want people to read the book. I really want people to read the book. And there's two areas I want to talk about a little bit later. But sure, we have a weak we have a weak mayoral system. Let's be honest. I think you 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 talk mm -hmm. about it in the book, and you just mentioned it there. And ego gets the best of every one of us and humility gets the best of uh, a few of us how do we change who we elect without saying you can't run unless you have humility to be in that position yeah or you have to pass a test exactly um, right and then right now the test is are you a citizen are you over 18 can you afford your Two hundred dollars, and can you get forty signatures, or whatever the number? Or is. and do you live in the actual city or town that you, uh, or is your main residence? Because I I've, I know I know a few mayors who used to have who live yeah. in other areas, but their main residence is in their community. Yeah, we've run across that a couple of times with council members as well when we're asked to check into things. Um, so, if given my my druthers, if in an ideal world, it starts with education. It starts with understanding civics. There, I, mean, I think local government comes up in grade nine. It should probably come up in grade 12 when you're about to go ready to vote uh, to understand kind of the role of local government or any government for that matter. The differentiation between, I kind of say there are four orders of government because I've started to put the indigenous government in there as an order of government in and of itself. The uh, understanding that. So I think part of it then is on the, is education through the, the school systems, which then relies on the provincial governments to do something about. As I mentioned, we've started to do candidate workshops for anybody who's interested in running so they understand what the job is. Oftentimes we've been doing that in conjunction with chambers of commerce because there is one of them everywhere and they often do things like host election forums. Uh, so though they seem to be a natural, sometimes we've done it with municipalities. Then there is a voter education that happens through the election campaign itself for a role clarity and what you should expect, what types of questions you should ask. When you come into office in Alberta, within 90 days, the province requires you, the municipality to host an orientation. Doesn't say anybody has to show up to it, which is kind of an interesting little quirk. But most uh, most codes of conduct, most municipal codes of conduct do require it. Uh, so there. So th there's the education, there's the pre-work for candidates, there's the education of the voters, there's the orientation of members. The problem with the orientation, particularly for new members, is it's they come in in the fall, they do the orientation, they look at the strap plan, they get on with budget. And this is all within the first six weeks or two months of their time. There's no way they remember it all. So I am a big proponent of ongoing professional development and training. I would, this mayor in Saskatchewan this morning, they're halfway through their term roughly. And I suggested to her that maybe they ought to be looking at like a midterm refresher. Like this is what the role is. And they bring someone like me in because I'm independent and the expert is always from somewhere else, right? So I have no baggage to carry and I enjoy doing those sorts of things. I encourage the elected officials to get out, to look beyond their own municipality or for the boards exactly to interact with one another, to determine where good practice, wise practice, best practice actually lies to bring it back to their own community, to look at mentorship arrangements, a brand new mayor who may be newly elected as well, 
may not really understand the role, but the mayor in the next town or the next rural municipality might. And so there's an opportunity there to build that relationship. The good people, the good ones, I think, keep on learning, keep challenging themselves. They work as a, as a municipal team to recognize that I don't need to be the smartest person in the room on all these topics. We've got some really good people around. Let's share that accountability or responsibility or training. Talk about some technical things, talk about procedural things, but talk about matters of interest and strategy as well. We, on, on our show, we cover municipal politics, provincial politics, right. and federal politics. And in, Al in Alberta, I can't say the same for BC because BC has a different uh, municipal system than Alberta. Right. Uh, it, they still have mayors and councillors, but they are a party system. And you run for certain parties in the lower mainland, like Vancouver, Victoria, Surrey, uh, all that area. Um, in Alberta, though, we have, you are a uh, free independent uh, candidate for everyone who's running. Right. In the day of polarization, in the day of polarization and everyone getting upset about what was just tweeted or what was just said on Facebook, um, the, the Reeves and the mayors and the councillors are the first line of politics that people have to deal with on a regular basis. Right. Some I have worked with and I have dealt with some municipal councillors and mayors who hold grudges. And yes. they, they you, you talk about this so eloquently in the book that you basically tell people, like literally in the first, like I think paragraph and a half in the chapter, I went, you basically just told them, if you're holding grudges, don't get involved in politics because you're not gonna last. Why, why? Why do people in municipal politics hold grudges so often? And why can't people just let it go? And I, I say that with all respect because I hold grudges for sometimes too. I had someone two years ago told, tell me, no, they don't want to show up on my show. And I yeah. still talk about it like there's no tomorrow. But why is holding grudges a bad thing in municipal politics? Well, first of all, I'm glad I didn't turn down your request to show up on your show. Um, I, well, I think, you know, I think grudges are a bad thing just in general. And the kinds we run across, often small towns have small town politics, little p politics, right? So sometimes we have run across times where two members of council in their mid thirties or forties or fifties didn't like each other in grade 10 because somebody did something nasty to the other one in grade 10. So that is just kind of considered and essentially just it's Hatfields and McCoy's family feud that's been running through the generations. Now it's grown up. It's not teenager anymore, but. Nobody really remembers why we don't like each other, but we don't. So that's, that's one of them and it comes, comes out. Another is because of political philosophy that, I mean, those on the left may not agree with those on the right. If they can share values, they're fine. If their values are disparate as well, then you've got a problem too. Another is because it, as you had suggested, individuals run. There's, there are no parties in Alberta. There are no parties in most of BC, Saskatchewan, on and on and on. Mo no parties across most of Canada. So in order for me to win, and I may have to beat one of your friends or neighbors. And I think that there's a bit of a grudge that can be held as part of that. Another can be early on in the days of a council, if we don't understand that the votes are all exact, count exactly the same, that you were the swing vote that got my thing defeated. And so I'm mad about that. I'm gonna get back at you later on. And so I have some conversations with some other members of council and we kind of decided that you're gonna lose your next vote. So these sort of things all happen. For the most part, they run a counter to codes of conduct, codes of ethics, whatever is published in the particular municipality. And I don't think we're gonna get away from it. For, and I don't actually mind, I don't like grudges, but I don't mind conflict politics. in that, well, maybe politics. I don't <laughs> mind the conflict that is healthy stress and tension between competing ideas. I think that's what makes us healthy. Again, if all the ideas were easy, you only need one of you to be there. So that I think is, a, is, a, is certainly a consideration. The reason I talked about grudges is because it, later on in the, the uh, book, you, you talk about a, an attribute that a mayor needs. The mayor or the board chair needs to basically say, 
enough is enough we need to work together they're basically yeah. the cheerleader for the town or community but also at the same time the ringleader of the circus to try and make <laughs> sure everything gets going here and that's my words it's not ian's <laughs> words so anyway i've who, used it though <laughs> <laughs> he, he they are the ringleader they they are the ones who have to make sure everything lines up make sure they work with the cao make sure those grudges those egos yeah. don't get in the way of making their better their community better yeah when you were talking to your uh, the people that you interviewed for the book, did they talk about how they had to balance that? Because you do need those conflicting sides. You need the, I need this uh, road done instead of this road. I need this yeah. water main line instead of this one. Did you talk to them about how to properly address those conflicting reports and conflicting sides to make sure that it doesn't make the council become a complete cluster of nothing happening because we have seen and there are a few councils in alberta right now where we are seeing that nothing's getting done because the mayor can't keep control of what's happening yeah twas the problem with this with the weak mayor system right the officially the mayor can't do anything about it unofficially again the mayor has a lot more symbolic power than they have real power and effective mayors see that and use it judiciously. When you come into office, you have a certain amount of political capital to spend because you got a bunch of votes and somebody put you into office. You can grow that or you can shrink it as you move throughout, throughout your term or beyond. A, a good mayor has been growing and growing and growing and can actually then choose to expand some of that in dealing with some of those conflicts. And some of it, I think you mentioned, was, is grandstanding. If we're all if we're, the five or seven of us are on council, there's an idea to come forward, we're all in violent agreement with one another. But we have to get our two, we have to get our two bits in, and I, I don't think that's an efficient use of time. So I think one of the suggestions that I have said is, well, why not start with no, right? If an idea comes forward and it's inherently good and we all agree with it, let's just get on with it, rather than all of us having to say our two bits about it. If somebody disagrees, then let's start a debate about it. And that's a, that's a, a anyway, to me, a more efficient use of time that is, I mean, I a joke that council meetings take all the time available plus 10%. Uh, and not, not all of them, but a lot of them do. And I wonder how you making effect, make effective decisions. So a chair or a mayor can certainly intervene at that spot and get some something happening. Okay, I'm going to challenge you a little bit here. Sure, go ahead. Ian, because I have dealt with a mayor. I, I used to cover politics back in Ontario for a local newspaper. And I dealt with a mayor who did everything in camera. All decisions were made in camera and they came to the council table, they made the vote, they basically, here's the motion, we've passed it, move on. There was no actual conversation. And as a journalist, I hated it because sure. literally, how do you write a story about this new multi-million dollar complex that's coming in when no one said anything? Is there a downside though, where everyone might be in agreement and no one says anything? Because sometimes, Let's be honest, the community wants to know why you want this. Instead of asking uh, councillor so-and-so on the street, I want to know they said it in council to make sure that it's on the record, it's in yeah. the minutes, and I don't want everything to be kumbaya, even though behind the scenes you hear councillors saying, I want to speak in front of council about this, but I've been told by the mayor I can't because he heavy-handedly told me, nope, move on. First of all, in a democratic process, somebody has to introduce the idea. And the introduction of the idea should contain a lot of those arguments that are in favor of it, or and may even speak to some of the reasons why things aren't happening. And if you want to have a bit of debate about that, fill your boots. But what I'm suggesting is droning on time after time after time, because everybody has to have their say on it across the bench. That's not a good, good use of time. Your comment too about in camera or closed sessions or private or whatever people call it is, based to me anyway, on the principle of transparency and or value, if you like, of transparency. And as an outsider versus as a counselor, the definition of transparency changes. Right? As, a, as a private citizen, I think, why are, what are all those people doing having conversations in private? What are they keeping from me? And th if that happens more and more and more, then the culture begins to expect that. And it becomes us versus them, them from the outside. These bastards are doing everything in private so that so we don't have to unlike the provincial or, ter or federal, which do almost everything in private. But the, if, you get, if you're now sitting on the bench as an elected official, you realize that there are implications around freedom of information or protection of privacy, which mandate you to be having some conversations in private. 
if it's got to do with legal or there's they typically have said land labor legal now that is i mean that's gross kind of there's a lot more nuance it's a really big umbrella if you ask me it's a very big umbrella but there are really good reasons for doing some things in confidence but it does certainly get abused from time to time uh, if we're looking at an investigation, uh, oftentimes it kind of starts with that because one member of council gets frustrated with how come we're doing so much stuff behind closed doors. And there's that like real or metaphorical manila envelope that gets slipped under the reporter's doors as well to try and build, break out some of this stuff. So it's, uh, when things are all rosy, there never, there doesn't seem to be a need for in camera. When things are maybe not looking so good for the council or for the municipality, then there's a really great interest. And let's not discuss this in front of everybody. Let's not air our dirty laundry. Even though legally, there's no reason you shouldn't. So to me anyway, when it comes to things like transparency, there's a, there's a, there's a continuum. It goes from one end where we say we should do everything in public unless there's a legal reason we can't. To the other end, we should do everything in confidence unless we actually have to release that information. So both of those are kind of legal. But there is a continuum on based on a principle. And to, I mentioned ongoing training earlier. And this is one of those places that I think ongoing training is important. Because if you look to the media, whether it's broadcast or print or online, the like like this excellent podcast, for example, oh. the uh, you you my you grudge for you is gone now, Ian. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But if you look at federally or provincially, a lot of things we just expect that it's going to be a fait accompli by the time the vote comes. So for a, a, the regular citizen who doesn't put a ton of thought into it or doesn't live in this world, maybe their expectation is the municipalities do it exactly the same way. But I think municipalities have, and really good mayors or reeves or chairs or whatever, can really push that a little bit and say, we're different. We believe you, the citizen, the voter, the association member, that we should be more accountable to you. And as such, we're going to do as much as possible as we can in, a, in an open environment. I, I know, I, I know we said 40 minutes and I, I have a few other questions if you don't sure. mind sitting with me. I talk a lot. Okay. No, but you, you, you bring so much great information to the, sh uh, the show, but also I want to remind everyone, please go get this book. The links in the show note, the DNA of great leaders, key attributes of the best mayors and board chairs. Um, yep. There you go. We'll do it together. Uh, there you go. Um, you talked about transparency and you talk yeah. about transparency in the book because the mayor's job and the board's chair job is to be as transparent as possible without being transparent, which is kind of a double-edged sword because as you, you are given a lot of information as a city councilor, as a mayor, as a board chair, and you can't have this conversation about what you're talking about in camera with your wife, with your friends, with your bar buddies, because there's a lot of information that could affect the day-to-day -day workings of council. Um, when you were talking to your, the mayors that you interviewed for the book, how, how do you balance that as a mayor? Did they talk about being able to balance transparency and confidentiality? Because you have to have both as a key attribute to be a good mayor, because yeah. you don't want to give out too much information, but you don't want to seem like you're too secretive, like you were just talking about and saying, well, I don't want to tell you this because it's in camera. And then you get the people on social media saying, oh, he's hiding something from us. They're going to spend our tax dollars and raise yep. it 4%. So what did the mayors talk about when they talked about that transparency versus confidentiality part to me the best of them have a have that balance as you reference down pat that the, the public has a right to know things unless they can't for whatever reason and you made a reference to you're not supposed to tell your spouse or partner and even time even sometimes outside a council meeting there's disclosure that happens almost by accident you mentioned bar buddies well what if you and i are on a council together we're sitting at denny's having our breakfast one day and we're just having a chat about what happened in council last night. But somebody, the local snoop is sitting behind us in the next booth. We're breaking in camera because somebody's overhearing it, right? Or maybe the local gadfly knows all members of council and so has a question about what happened in council last night. Oh, I, I can't tell you, but a little bit gets out. And then goes and talks to the other six members of council. Now you've got, you've got a pretty good story going on at that point. And we've seen both of these things happen, which is why they're, they're kind of real instances. But the best of the mayors can really say, you know, the five of us or the three or the seven or 13 in some cases are the first team of this community. We were elected by our peers. 
and we are given responsibility over and above that of the average citizen, which sometimes also brings us almost into conflict with our citizens, because we make decisions based on 100% of the information that we have, not saying you'll ever have all the information, but the citizen is then judging that decision that gets made based on 60 or 70% of the information, which is pu available publicly. So that other 30 or 40% might make the decision move from a yes to a no or vice versa, because I know a little bit more about that. So understanding that that's around governance and that's strategic and that's long-term and there's probably some short-term pay to go pain to go with that long-term gain. That's I think how the mayor need or the chair needs to convince the other members of council as far as possible they can that this main, maintenance of confidentiality is important now and it has long-term implications for the community as well. Whether we maintain confidentiality, make a decision for the long-term benefit of the community or if we break confidentiality and things go sideways, you, you know, up the creek without a paddle, and to quote you. Well, thank you for quoting me. Hopefully it's remember. in book three. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a book on podcasts. There you go. Municipal podcasting. There you go. Um, I, I, you said something and I just needed clarification for myself here. You talked about Councillor A and B, so in this case, Councillor Brown and Councillor McCormick, uh, sitting at Denny's having a discussion about what was in camera. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, and this I'm not sure if you would know this off the top of your head, and uh, I'm assuming you're an encyclopedia of municipal <laughs> politics in Alberta, so you'll have this off the top of your head. Councillors cannot meet outside of council meetings to discuss what happened in council, no ifs, ands, or buts, according to the MGA, correct? No, uh, so sort of nuanced. A majority of members can't get together. There you go. Okay, so you and if, I can have a conversation. But, but if, if we were a council of three, we would not be able to do that. That's correct. And okay. that's one of the real interesting things about a council of three, is it's always got to be at, at least two people in favor yeah. of something, which is like a two, it's a sixty-six percent requirement to pass anything. It's a sixty-six percent to pass anything, and it's a quorum because you can't have one person at your meeting because true too. you're not at quorum. Um, yeah. My last question, uh, topic I want to talk about, and it's uh, later on in the book, and you talk about dancing with the one you brought. Yeah. So you talk about twenty-five great attributes that um, uh, mayors and uh, board chairs should have, and sometimes you get it wrong. Sometimes the voters, the voters are always right because they vote yep. for the person, but sometimes it's not the best. Um, in Alberta, we have the Recall Act. We can recall politicians municipally. Are you saying, and this is more of an attribute to uh, me asking the author and not the mayors who you interviewed, but is the Recall Act a bad path forward for getting it wrong and then being able to turf people out if you have a mayor or a councillor who you just don't agree with anymore? Well, first of all, as for the voters, no matter who you vote for, the government always wins. Um, but when it comes to recall, and <laughs> when it comes to recall, I'm not a fan of recall. Uh, I, you can get recalled for legal reasons, of course, if you just municipally. If you disqualify yourself for a variety of different reasons, you can be declared, uh, the seat can be declared vacant because you have to resign or a judge can decide that the seat is vacant. So that can happen. When it comes, and the bar for recall in Alberta is really high. But it, what scares me a little bit about it, or a lot about it, is again, if I'm making decisions with 100% of the information, you're, make, you're, you're making your decision with 60 or 70% of the information. My decision may seem short term wrong even though in the long term, it's going to have benefit. If I'm worried about being recalled over the four year term, even though this decision may not come for a decade or more planning decision or zoning or something, I may not make the right decision because I'm concerned about being uh, victimized by having what is it, legislation weaponized against me, whether it's a bylaw or whether it's a provincial act. I'm not aware of any, uh, any movements to recall as of now. I could be wrong, but I just haven't heard of any. That are coming. Maybe the bar is really high, and people don't think it's it's actually. A, but it, it's it's it seems like populist drivel rather than anything that's got substantive benefit. The reason I asked the question is because you spoke to mayors and Reeves and uh, mayors of uh, small, medium, and uh, large cities. Um, 
did they ever express concern to you as when when you have to make a decision as a mayor or, or a board chair, you have to make a decision and then you have to go face the voters in the local grocery store. So you are going to upset somebody no matter what. And you Absolutely. are going to hear about it at the local grocery store, at your restaurant, at your place of business, because you often work in the community. Yep. Did you hear from the, your mayors when you spoke to them about the balance of you, you need to get it right, but you need to stand behind how you got to the right position that you voted on. Because yeah. you can vote and you can then whiffle waffle and say, well, I'm I, sorry, I, I didn't mean to make that vote. I regret it now. At the end of the day, once you make the vote, you have to stand behind that decision, good, bad, or indifferent, even though yeah. you might get some backlash. And with recall now, do mayors now feel more hesitant to make big decisions? You know, I'm not, I did not a single mayor brought that up huh. as an issue. They, I would be more concerned about a mayor who was wishy-washy, like waffling, as you have said. Now, the caveat or the, to that was, I didn't ask the question about, did the motion pass even though you may have voted against it? Because it still becomes a council decision, right? Yeah. So yeah. that question, I can't answer that way, but they all said, we're here for a good time, not a long time, right? The voters get to decide every four years whether we have done our job or not. And I would rather be, I'd rather be judged on what I did this way than some of the, the stuff that I did just because it might have been popular. It's governance and it's long term, it's strategic. Again, you're, you're going to have some, some disagreement, you're going to disagree, get disagreement on the most benign of, of motion. So there is, you're right, you're always going to get the criticism. But these mayors all said, uh, we're here for the benefit, long term benefit of our community. And if the voters agree with us, fantastic. If the voters don't agree mistakes? with it, that's their prerogative. Pardon? Did, did they admit mistakes in their time well, for the former mayors? Yeah. Did they ever say, you know what, we did get it wrong sometimes, but at the time we thought we were doing it right? Yeah, I, now, not all of them, because I didn't ask them all those questions, but uh, the ones I did ask, all of them said, we are not infallible. This, this is uh, us doing the best we can with the knowledge that we have. We are not experts in everything. We've hired experts in terms of whether it's an executive director or a commission, commissioner or, or a CAO. CAO, SAO, or CEO, all the same role. Um, those are, that's why we hired those people. And not only that, the best of them said, we actually give you permission to make mistakes. We want you to be innovative in our community as a council and as an administration. So if that's gonna have to happen, we want innovation. We know not all of innovation is gonna work. So we are willing to accept a certain amount of risk, blowback on council for approving something that eventually didn't work. But they've said it's important for us to move forward in some way. We want to change. There's risk associated with it. And so we're willing to accept some of that. We're willing to make some mistakes. We're willing to uh, allow our administration to make mistakes. And that filters down culturally as well. But I'm willing, as a, as a frontline person, I'm willing to try something or suggest something that might not work because I know council's got my back or the, the board has my back. I think that's pretty cool. Ian, I want to thank you so much for sitting down for the last 15 minutes and talking about your newest book, The DNA of Great Leaders, Key Attributes of the Best Mayors and Board Chairs, which is now on sale. The link is in the show notes. Highly recommend it if you are in Ontario right now or Manitoba. Their municipal elections are coming up. If you're thinking about putting your name forward, highly recommend you picking up this book because it is a good self-reflection for not only those who are wanting to get into politics or run for mayor or be a board chair, but also for councillors. And we often forget that in our weak mayoral system, you always have to remember that the mayor is one vote, one vote at the end of the day. And councillors can pick up this book as well, but also pick up Who's Driving the Greater as well, which is also on sale. Link will be in the show notes as well. Ian, you, you've knocked it out of the park again with another great book. And I look forward to the third book next year, 2023. We'll have you back on to talk about whatever the topic is that is municipal politics in the world of Ian McCormack. Thank you so much. If you have, if you have a great idea, let me know. By the way, BC is also going to the polls this fall. Oh, um, that's right. BC as well. And I think yeah, if so I'm not mistaken, of we're one of the Atlantic provinces as well, but I forgot which one it was. So I didn't want to say it out loud. <laughs> There you go. So, Chris, thank you so much. I I, sh I share a passion with you for this, and I'm more than happy to talk to you at any time with, uh, as you see fit. 
Yes. Well, we, in September, we're going to be sitting down with a lot of the mayors and uh, councillors from across Alberta because we are one year into their first term and we will catch up with some of the reeves of mayors and councillors from across the province. So with that reminder, everyone, pick up a copy of the DNA of Great Leaders by Ian McCormack. The link's in the show notes. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, get up from behind social media. Go have a conversation with somebody. It does make your society better. Talk to you later, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody.